everyone. I am so happy to be here with you. I've been so looking forward to this. I was supposed to come in August, but COVID and all the things. So I'm really glad to be here with you because I have loved you since your beginning. Um, I secretly wanted to come, but it didn't work out. And um, I have loved Kenny and Blanca and Brittany and Ben, and, and, and we stay connected, and I pray for you and think about you guys often. So it is a real gift for me to get to be here and worship alongside you today. So thank you for having me. Um, so also, I want to celebrate this new space that you're in. I was actually supposed to be here the first Sunday you were here, and I was so excited about it, and it didn't work out, but I'm happy to be here now. This is an awesome place that God's provided for you guys. So I pray many, many blessings over it. So Advent is a wonderful time of year, and I'm a huge fan of liturgy like Advent and Lent because it's a time when you can like kind of really focus your life and your schedule and your rhythms on on, on the, on, and turning your attention towards God. So we have these like, in, in more liturgical churches where they follow the church calendar, there's these two big markers. They do other things as well throughout the year, but the two more mainstreamed ones are Advent and Lent. And both are times where there's practices and, and different ways that we're encouraged to slow down our very hectic lives and turn our attention towards God. The word Advent, it comes from the Latin word adventus, which means coming or arrival. And so if you weren't here last week for Brittany's introduction, what we're doing is we're celebrating the coming of Jesus as a baby onto the earth, and we celebrate his arrival being here with us now in our midst, and we wait with anticipation for his coming. So this theme... God come down, I love it so much. And I listened to, to, your, to your time together last week and I love the question that Brittany asked. What kind of God would leave the splendor of heaven and come down to the brokenness of earth? Who would leave the glory of the throne for the lowliness of the manger? Who does this and why? So when Brittany asked me to come and teach here today, she asked me to focus on a few questions, and that was, what can we understand about the character of God and the nature of God through his incarnation, and of all the ways that God could have chosen to engage with humanity, to pursue and save creation, why would he choose to become like his creation? And today specifically, what does it mean for Jesus to take on the form of a servant when he could have come down as a conquering king? And what does it say about God and the way he interacts with us? So I love the way you guys have um, started the practice of embodying the, the posture of listening and waiting and expecting. So I'd love to open up with a scripture this morning. I have a lot of scripture, but this is a short one, so you can stand up for the short one this morning. <laughs> but I'd love to open up with this scripture from Isaiah 30, verse 18, just to orient ourselves towards God's disposition towards us. So so as we stand, we embody, we want to embody this, we want to take it in, and we want to, with our bodies, respond to God's word. So maybe before we read it together, close your eyes and take a deep breath and just acknowledge how your body even feels right now. See, our bodies are a temple of God, and just like a house, when the beams are drooping, or there's a leak in the ceiling, it tells you something. And so it's important that we learn to listen to what God might be saying to us through our bodies. Isaiah 30, verse 18 says, Therefore, the Lord is waiting to show you mercy and rising up to show you compassion. For the Lord is a just God, all who wait patiently for him are happy. The Bible was given to us that we might know who God is, what he's like, and what it is to walk with him. So in this season today of waiting in Advent, I want you to know 
that God's posture towards you is one of compassion. So as you enter in this morning and we turn our attention towards Jesus who has compassion for you in the season of longing and waiting, what are you waiting for? Just take a moment and just think about it to yourself and talk to God about it. What are you waiting for? What are you longing for? Where do you need compassion? Where do you need mercy? During Advent, I think a lot about the 400 years of silence between, in the intertestamental period, between the old and the new, where God didn't speak for 400 years, and it would have been really tempting to believe that he was gone, that the people were forgotten, and yet we know that the Bible tells us that God is always at work, so silence does not equal absence. Maybe you're in a season of feeling like God has been silent. So ask him to come. God, we posture ourselves to receive today and we ask that your Holy Spirit would help us orient our hearts and minds towards you this morning. Your word says that you are both kind and strong and so we welcome your kindness and your strength today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So the church that I belong to is called Journey Church, and what we have been doing every week is we've been practicing responding to our time in the Word together with prayer and reflection, and so we have these prayer walls that we've built around the room, and we invite our community to go to the stations, we call them stations, and write what their prayers are and roll them up and stick them in the prayer wall and then we pray for them all week. And this last week in particular, we were focusing on lament. And everyone in the church, basically, I mean, it was amazing how many people got up. They were invited to come up and write down what in particular they are lamenting. And so we wrote all kinds of things. I mean, it was, it was really raw and it was really honest. I mean, people were lamenting broken relationships, broken marriages, um, the loss of their children, the loss of their loved ones, the empty spaces at the Thanksgiving table, um, the lack of provision that they were feeling, the loss of a job. There were so many things that we were grieving and lamenting together. And so, the last couple of weeks as I've been praying and asking God, like, God, what do you have for Remembrance Church today? Why am I going and what might you say to Remembrance Church through me? Through me? And in the last week, God really began to, to, t to tell me and encourage me that like, that's what we were lamenting at Journey, but it is a, it is a collective lament. And these are things that we're all experiencing. And I look around this room and I look around this city and I have to believe that, that all those laments are not unique to us in our community. So I wanna focus on the, the, the scripture that we just read as we, as we talk about Jesus becoming a servant. I really wanna talk about the one, the one, one of the answers to the question of why would Jesus come in the flesh is this word compassion. The scripture said that, that the Lord is waiting to show you mercy and rising up to show you compassion. Compassion is a combination of two different words, come, which means with, and pathos, which means pain. So the literal meaning of the word compassion is to be with someone in their pain. Now, the Hebrew language, it's a verb-based language, so everything is anchored in the action and in movement and embodiment. That's why I love standing for, for listening to scripture and posturing ourselves or kneeling in prayer. Like, it's, it's important that we move with what God is, is asking of us. So when biblical, the Bible talks about compassion, it's not just an emotion, it's actually a location with someone in their pain, 
when someone locates themselves with someone in their pain. So when the Bible says that the Lord your God is a God of grace and compassion, that he longs to be gracious and compassionate with you, the living God longs to locate himself with you. In those very places of pain and lament and brokenness and disorientation where things are upside down and not making sense. So when we talk about God taking on the form of a servant in the flesh of Jesus Christ, it's because he is compelled by his compassion towards you. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the God of heaven and earth put on flesh in the form of a servant and longs to locate himself with you. He longs to be where you are and to show you compassion and not just when you're doing great, but when you're hurting, when you're lonely, when you're angry, when you're questioning, all of it. And Jesus the servant isn't begrudgingly or reluctantly coming to serve. He doesn't do it in some obligatory way. He serves because it, was, it is who he is and who, who he was, who he is, and who he is to come. He serves from a place of compassionate and gracious love, and this is what I want us to orient ourselves towards today. As we devote ourselves to the anticipation of God coming down in Advent, it's important that we keep in mind that it's not just at Advent time, but the entire biblical story is a story of God coming down. It's the story of God coming closer and closer and closer. So you might be familiar with the words in Genesis 1, right? That the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Anytime you hear the Spirit of God hovering over anything, he's about to do something amazing. So in, in Genesis 1, the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. He was getting ready to create. And then in Exodus, he, he's with the Israelites living in the tent, and he says, I want you to build a tent for me. I'm not content to just be hovering over and being up there and out there. I want to come and live with you and dwell with you and tabernacle with you, live with you and among you in the tents. And so he's going from hovering, from moving from hovering to coming down and living in and among. And then in the New Testament, when we see Jesus, we see God taking on flesh and coming down to the ground. Jesus begins to walk the earth and walk with people and walk toward people. So we see, we, we read read stories of Jesus with the woman with the issue of blood where he walks toward her and he lets her touch him. And we see Jesus going to the grave of Lazarus and he sits there and waits and he weeps and he shares the pain of Martha and Mary. He comes closer and closer to our pain. So we go from hovering over and coming down and moving towards and getting closer and cr closer. And then at Pentecost, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of the living God comes inside us and dwells within us. So we're hovering over and he's coming down and coming towards and eventually living inside us. So as we celebrate Advent, we celebrate this coming closer and closer and closer and we look to the future and we speculate, what is it gonna be like when he comes again? What is he gonna be like? Now, really smart people for thousands of years have been talking about what it's gonna be like and some, in some ways they agree and in some ways they don't, but you know what you can bet on? I'm pretty sure we can bet on that it's gonna be how we least expect it, Amen. right? We can know for sure that God often shows up in ways we least expect because if we look at the story of Jesus, the first advent when God came down and moved towards, it was nothing like what people expected, right? I mean, the people of Israel were not expecting their Messiah to show up as a servant and use servant language and do servanty things, right? They were expecting this conquering king, this prince of peace that they were told about, this everlasting father of greatness whose government and peace was gonna be on his shoulders, right? They did not expect a 15-year-old virgin, virgin <laughs> in an obscure village in Israel to give birth to a baby in a manger. 
They did not expect that the first people to be told about the savior of the world, the king of kings, was going to be the shepherds who were like the dirty, outcast people that no one wanted to be around, and they were the first people invited to go and be with the savior. That was not expected. They were not expecting the Messiah to be born the son of a carpenter. I mean, nothing, what good can come out of Nazareth, right? That's what the Bible says. They never would have guessed it. They never would have believed that the people he would have chosen as his disciples were going to be a tax collector and a zealot and some fishermen and let's not forget the woman with seven demons, right? And they would have died if you would have told him he was going to come and he was going to eat his way through his time on earth and share the table with people that other people would have frowned upon because sharing the table with someone meant acceptance and love and welcoming and hospitality and knowing a person. And and he did that, and that was not what people expected. Everything about Jesus, everyone he hung out with, the places he went to, the people he touched, it was so subversive to the status quo. It was unexpected for any rabbi, much less the Messiah, who was going to come and deliver his people. So in the short three years of his earthly ministry, Jesus blew off his family at the temple when he was 12. He turned water into wine at a wedding for his first miracle. He calmed the sea with a word from his mouth. He turns two fish and five loaves into into a feast for thousands. He healed the sick. He gave sight to the blind. And when he invited people to come and follow him and to put his yoke upon them, he described himself using words like gentle and lowly. It turns out that being gentle and lowly is actually subversive to the kingdoms of this world. Gentle and lowly. I mean, gentle and lowly is revolutionary. And I say this out loud and I get this big lump in my throat because I don't think we're identified as a gentle and lowly people. The people, they didn't get it, and and they missed it because he was not who they expected. He was not what they expected. The religious leaders didn't get it. Jesus was in the synagogue on the Sabbath, and he healed a man with a withered hand, and everyone was in awe except for the religious leaders. It says in, in, um, I think it's Mark 10, 14, it says the 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 Pharisees went out and plotted against him and how they might kill him. They didn't get it. The politicians didn't get it. They collaborated with the Pharisees to have him killed. The disciples really didn't get it. I mean, in Mark 10, they're walking and Jesus says to them, he predicts his death for the third time. Listen to what he says. He says, we're going to Jerusalem The son of man will be handed over to the chief priests and scribes and they will condemn him to death. Then they will hand him over to the Gentiles and they will mock him, spit on him, flog him and kill him and he will rise after three days. Jesus says this and what's followed is the most ridiculous response from the disciples, James and John. They basically ignore this like major thing that he just said and they decide it's a good time to ask him who is gonna be seated on his right and his left in prominence in the kingdom. I mean, if Jesus took on the form of a mother, he would have slapped them upside the head. Like not the time or the place, right? So, but what does Jesus do? He, he gets it that they don't get it. He calls them together and he gives them one of the most profound teachings on servant leadership. And he, he talks about the rulers of the world and what they're like, that they lord over their authority over people and they're tyrannical. And he says, you're not to be like that. 
because he says in, in Mark 10, 43, he says, it is not so among you. On the contrary, wh whoever wants to be great among you, you will be your servant. Whoever wants to become great among you will be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you will be a slave to all. For even, even the Son of Man came, did not come to be served, but to, to serve and to be a ransom for many. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. This is why he came, to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so even towards the end of his life, I mean, this is not the first incident of them not getting it. Even towards the end of his life, before this is all gonna go down, it happens again in this moment in this beautiful moment where Jesus embodies his extraordinary servant nature with the disciples and he explains why. So if you have a Bible or if you're online and you are joining us online, if you have your phone or whatever, I think we have it up here too. Join me in John 13, verse one. John chapter 13, verse one. It says, before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And when it was time for supper, the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, Simon Iscariot's son, to betray him. Jesus knew that the Father had given everything into his hands and that he had come from God and that he was going back to God. So he got up from supper and he laid aside his outer clothing and took a towel and tied it around himself. Next he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to dry them with the towel tied around him. He came to Simon Peter who asked him, Lord, are you gonna wash my feet? And Jesus answered him, what I'm doing you don't realize now but afterward you will understand. You'll never wash my feet, Peter said. Jesus replied, if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. One who has bathed, Jesus told him, doesn't need to wash anything but his feet, but he's completely clean. You are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him, and this is why he said, not all of you are clean. When Jesus had washed their feet and put on his outer clothing, he reclined again and said to them, do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're speaking rightly, since that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done for you. Truly, I tell you, a servant is not greater than his master, and a messenger is not greater than the one who sent him. In the New Testament, the word servant, the word that's translated servant is actually, it actually means slave. And it's referred to as someone who was owned or controlled by someone else, not just a servant hired to do a certain job. Some slaves performed menial tasks, others called stewards supervised the work of lesser servants and managed the master's finances. And so in the time of Jesus, some people were slaves because they were, they were born to slave parents and some were captured and sold into slavery. The word servant um, is doulos in Greek and it means more literally a slave or a bond servant, someone who sets aside all of their rights to serve another. So because the word slave carries such a negative connotation to our modern sensitivities, we often choose to use the word servant. However, servant doesn't quite capture, doesn't quite capture 
the real meaning. Paul referred to himself as a slave to Christ. Someone who sets aside all rights of their own to serve another. In this case, in this case, Jesus was willingly, willing to become that. I just want that to like set on you for a second. Because I think we know that, but we often, it's one of those parts of the Bible that we're so familiar with that we just kind of like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But he willingly chose to set aside all of his rights for your flourishing, for your livelihood, for all of us. So for us, the word servant still isn't super great, right? I mean, slave certainly isn't, and servant isn't super great. It doesn't have great positive connotations. I mean, we, we talk about serving, like we serve at church and we serve a ministry, we serve Young Life, and that's all really good, and I would, I, I'm, I'm, saying this with all due respect to all of us, myself included, we have the luxury of picking and choosing how we wanna serve and how it meets our time and our schedule and how it's convenient for us, you know? I mean, you can wash somebody's feet if they're like, you know, pedicured and normal and stuff, but these feet were nasty. <laughs> These were dirty feet that wore sandals, that were walking the streets of Israel and the roads that aren't paved like our roads. I mean, they had cakey, nasty dirt underneath the toenails and, and, and there was no like happy nails where people were going and getting them cleaned up or anything like that. It was gross. It was gross, right? And I, I think about that a lot. I mean, I had a situation happen last week with this thing that we're doing at church and, and this person, I'm gonna, I, this is not, it's not my church and they're not listening so I'm gonna vent for a minute. They, they, I mean, this person was just in a really, really hard place and they were um, not very happy with whatever it was that I was doing to try to accommodate and serve them and so at one point I was like, forget it, I'm done with you. I'm not doing that for you anymore, you know? And the Lord convicted me because we, we just get to pick and choose. And, and listen, I'm all about self-care and good boundaries. I think that's so important and so helpful, and we have to be discerning. And even Jesus didn't, didn't serve every single person with his hands and his feet. I mean, he did what the Father told him to, and, and that's what we have to do. But I do think that we have made serving convenient. And even, the, even public servants, there was a time where public servants were really recognized as these amazing people that had so, get, had so much respect from the community, and our public servants don't even receive the respect, that many of them are, are you know, they deserve it, right? Some don't, and some really do, and we, you know, we get to decide who we're going to respect as a public servant, right? But Jesus, he washed all of their feet, even Judas's. Let's not forget that Judas was there and he washed all of their feet. It doesn't say he washed them all except for Judas because he knew Judas was about to betray God. It doesn't say that. It says he knew, but he washed them anyway. It was counterintuitive to what we think. And so Peter's response is so consistent with James and John's, this resistance to no, 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 you can't wash my feet. Everything about it was counterintuitive, that the savior of the world, the Messiah, would want to come and wash their feet. The ruler of heaven and earth removes his outer garments. The one who at, who, Every knee will bow in heaven and earth. Every knee will bow in heaven and earth to Jesus. And what does he do? He bows and he kneels and he washes their feet. Peter could not wrap his mind around the fact. John and James couldn't wrap their minds around the fact that whoever wants to be great must become a servant. Whoever wants to be first and prominent must become a slave to all. He was so uncomfortable. And I wonder why. 
how do you feel about it? I mean, when you, when, when, when you pray, do you pray to God, the servant? I mean, it's so like not what we're used to, right? We, 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 we like to pray to God, the King of Kings, the majestic one, the, the strong one, and yet we think if we pray to God, the servant, that that somehow diminishes all of that? But that's not the case. All the fullness of God dwelt in Jesus. All of it, right? We don't get to pick the times and the places and the people that we serve. We don't get to determine the outcome if we're gonna be according to the kingdom. We're gonna do it according to what God wants, right? And this can look a variety of different ways. Jesus came and he loved people. The way he served people was he loved people. He wasn't afraid to get his hands dirty. He wasn't afraid to sit in hard conversations. He wasn't afraid to go near people in their suffering. He, wasn't, he, his, he didn't go to people based on whether they were gonna follow him or not. Some didn't and he still went to them. He served God to the people. He served God's loving kindness and hospitality and love to his people. I have a friend who, um, when she was, when she was uh, before she was married, she was dating her husband, and he came from a really strong Christian family, and she did not. And they started dating, and they decided to move in together. And his mom was this super godly woman, well-respected by many, many people. And my friend at the time was not a believer. And she tells this story because she says, you know, I was not a believer. I was dating her son. We moved in together. I'm sure she wasn't happy about it, but she showed up at our apartment with plates and glasses and all these things to furnish our apartment. And she never made her feel less than or judged or unaccepted because of their decision that they made. I think her mom had, his mom had the sensibility to know that they weren't walking with God, so why would they walk in the ways of God? And so she just chose to love them anyway, and her love and the way she served my friend eventually drew her into the love of the Father. And so Paul tells us that this is our disposition to be like God in this way, to be like Jesus in this way, to go and to serve and to humble ourselves. Even when we think we know what's right and what's best, we humble ourselves. We go low so Jesus can be magnified, right? So look at Philippians 2. In verse 1, he says, Paul says, if there's any encouragement in Christ... If any consolation of love, any fellowship with the Spirit, any affection and mercy, these are all the words that we used earlier today, right, at the beginning, make my joy complete, thinking the same way, having the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. A lot of times we read those scriptures and we think we have to be unified with each other. No, it's unified with God. It's thinking the same way as Jesus. It's having the same love as Jesus. It's being united in spirit with Jesus the servant, intent on one purpose, the same purpose that Jesus had to join God in his mission to reconcile the world. Everyone should look not to his own interests, but to the interests of others. Adopt the same attitude as Jesus, who existing in the form of God, the NIV says, being in the very nature of God. So it wasn't that he was just like God. His whole nature was God. God's nature is to serve. And he didn't consider equality with God something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. His nature is God. He became like us to bring God to us, to show that God is in us and can be with us. And when he came as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. The death on the cross was the most humiliating, awful death that you could ever die. There was no dignity in dying on a cross. So even to the point of death on the cross, and it's for this reason that God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every other name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow 
in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth to the one who knelt low. So when you pray, do you look to God as a servant? Do you see his likeness being the very nature of God as a servant, as one who came to serve us? Because if we're gonna have the mindset of Jesus, we really have to take that in. Otherwise, we just serve because it's the nice thing to do, and it's polite, and that's what Christians do. You come to church, you join a small group, and you serve. Check, check, check. Right? But he humbled himself. He didn't have to. He could have called 10,000 angels to come down and rescue him. He didn't have to. He freely gave his life. Why? He freely gave his life in the most humiliating way. Why? I mean, do you think that right now in our time that the world looks at Christians and says, oh yeah, those are the ones who serve? Or do they see us as people who are grasping for power and the seats of prominence? Do they see us being gentle? Do they see us getting low? I mean, I was thinking about this last week when all that stuff was going down in the Supreme Courts, and I was like, what would it be like if Christians set up like tents outside of abortion clinics, and not as picketers, but as people who were there to hold the grieving? What if we were there outside when a doctor left and said, hey, how was your day? What was that like? Without judgment, but saying like, oh, what would that be like? I have a friend who has a um, child that was born a girl and is now identifying as a boy. And they just spent Thanksgiving with their extended family and she sent an email to the whole family and prepared them and said, the one thing that I want to make clear is I don't want my daughter to believe or take on that God does not love her from any of us as we figure out how to walk this out. I don't have answers for any of that stuff. And I know like I'm on shaky ground and I might not be invited back by bringing up all that stuff. But like, it, this is the world we live in, you guys. This is the stuff that we're all lamenting, that we're all trying to figure out. And one of the ways I've been trying to practice this is I'm a super judgmental person. And I like, when I watch the news, when I'm on social media and I see stuff and I read what people write and I just like have all kinds of judgments and I'm really trying to practice when I have those negative judgments about people, it's to just stop and pray and bless them. That's a way to serve. That's, that's point one of serving. Pray for your, I mean, Maybe they're enemies sometimes. Pray for your enemies. Bless those who persecute you. Bless those who disagree with you. Pray for the people that you think have totally lost their god-awful minds, right? Pray for them and maybe God will give you marching orders for something else, some other way to serve them. Our Lord and Savior, our King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Prince of Peace, the Messiah, the ever-coming one came not to be served, but to serve. He served by coming near, by washing feet, by lifting heads, by bringing dignity, justice, righteousness to the oppressed. He met the wandering on the roads that they were on, the skeptics and the places of their doubts and denials. The God of gracious love and compassion came down and gave his life in order that we might live. And he did this because you and I and those who are not with him yet, those who are not in him yet, were worth dying for. And so I want to invite the girls back up here for worship, and I want to just take a moment and find some stillness as they come back up here. I 
And take, just take another deep breath and I wonder, what do you think about all that? And close your eyes or maybe find a place of focus on the floor that can kind of shut off any distractions around the room for a moment. And think about what I just said. That you might be worth dying for. Because if we can't grasp that, our serving God, our serving his people has to come out of a place of response to his love for us. We love because he first loved us. If we wanna have the same mindset of Christ, we have to know that we're one with God. There's a song that we sing every year at Christmas about a thrill of hope and the rejoicing of a weary world. It's O Holy Night. And there's a line in that song that says, long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. When was the last time your soul felt its worth? Mm -hmm. 